crazy. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. You guys are super fast learners. I know that. Let's do that for Jesus instead of me. Is that all right? Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I'm going to be surprised if Pastor Daniel can walk tomorrow after those two. I wish I could have videoed that. That's classic. I wish I could do that. <laughs> Honestly. Wow. That's amazing. He just came back from a week of refreshing on vacation. So he's feeling like all loose, ready to go. Now, after today, he said, now give me three or four more days. I'm good. I just had to get my church fix in. <laughs> Woo. Well, so we're, we're, we're speaking on feedback this morning, so we're intentionally giving you a little bit so you remember what it sounds like. <laughs> Not really. It just happens occasionally. But we are on the subject of feedback, one of our core values here at the Heights Church. And feedback is so valuable. Uh, it's, it's so important. And in fact, what Pastor Daniel just did, not realizing it, is we all appreciate feedback. When, when you walk in and someone welcomes you, maybe you've had a surprise birthday party and you walk in, everybody says surprise. It feels good for people to give you that kind of feedback or to say, we love you or appreciate you or we applaud you. And if you've ever spoke in front of somebody, uh, the last thing you want is when you get off the platform, somebody says, man, that was terrible. I mean, like, oh. That was terrible. You, you, you hope to get good feedback, you know, and, and sometimes you get that from expressions, from reactions, from participation. And so this morning, you guys are uh, up for the challenge a little bit. So I'm looking for some great feedback. Uh, don't lie about it. If it's terrible, just be sure, and as we talked about last week, give it in a lot of love when you package that. Hey, that wasn't very good, but hopefully, hopefully it'll be all right this morning. But feedback is something that is more valuable than we realize. If, if you're a business owner, uh, if you ever run a restaurant or, or, or in sales or as a church, we value feedback a lot from our staff and our teams, our leadership teams, all the way through the organization, even to all of you. Feedback is important because it helps us figure out where we're at and are we accomplishing what's in the heart of God to accomplish. And so without feedback, you don't know that. And so we are here to serve you, not you serve us. And so as pastors and leaders, our job is to be like Jesus and serve those that God has entrusted us with to steward and to lead. And so it's our highest priority to be the servants of all of you, not just the dominating leader over you or telling you what to do. We come underneath you and serve you and equip you and empower you and help you find freedom. That's our desire. But it's good to know where we're at in the journey. It's good to have that feedback. Feedback is healthy. It helps you be successful in the things that you do. And so great organizations have figured out, let's get some feedback. There's surveys everywhere now. If you buy something on Amazon, they send a survey. I got one this morning. I bought a, a little blinker for my, my daughter's Jeep that we just sold. And so I don't need the blinker anymore, but I, I bought it and then we sold the Jeep. But they were asking me, how, how, did, how did you enjoy that part? Did that park work well? And they had this huge survey. They're finding out everything. Was our service good? Was our delivery time good? Was the product good? That's wisdom because without that, People can say, man, that was the worst experience I've ever had, and they don't know it. If they know it, they can do something about it. And so great, great organizations will do something about it. And that's, as a church, we know that that's helpful in becoming the best that we can be for what God's called us to be. Like, feedback can also help save your life. If you don't know the dangers are around, it's good for there to be a bridge out sign when you get close and like, hey, stop going this way. And uh, uh, Pastor Daniel and Ashley just got back from vacation. I think they went to the beach for a little while, got outdoors, a little cooler where you were than where we are. Um, but we did the same. We went out for a few days. We love to, uh, to camp. We love to be out, outdoors. Uh, we're, we don't love being outdoors at 105 anymore. We've <laughs> checked that off. We like to be out in 75 or 80. I'm thinking we need to be going to Colorado this time of year, and we'll come back here in the winter. But uh, this, this being outdoors and being, like, I think about Lake Granberry, and I don't know if you've been around this area for a long time. I grew up, uh, raised in Cleburne. My, my dad loved to fish, and so we would come over here fishing quite a bit as a, as, a, as a boy, a young man. And I remember back in the day, I can say that now, the lake was full of trees. I mean, it was just like a forest. There was a creek channel that went down the middle of the lake, but there was trees standing everywhere, and that's what made it so good for fishing. And so now if you go look at the lake, it looks like just this big, clear, beautiful body of water. I see all these people skiing out there, and I'm thinking, they don't have a clue what they're doing. 
I mean, just under the surface of all of that water are all of these huge trees. We've seen them. We know they're there. They didn't go anywhere. The tops rotted off that, had, that they were exposed to the elements, but under the surface, they're there. We were at Lake Whitney this week, and I've been on that like my whole life, but it's, it's way low as well, lower than normal. Fortunately, Granberry typically remains. There's been some years it wasn't a constant level lake, but it's known as a constant level lake. Whitney's so low, we're going down through the the big water of Lake Whitney, and there's an island that's much bigger island than it used to be, and then there's this, this low area between the, the island and all the way over here to shore, a couple hundred yards, that was only like a foot deep. Now, the lake's only like four or five foot low, but I'm thinking, we have gone over that spot hundreds of times. People have gone over that spot. There was tree stumps everywhere. There was, I'm like, I had no idea how dangerous that area right there was. Fortunately, they've gotten smart and they build sonars and these electronics for boats that, that can tell you what's under the surface. And they work by sending signals down and bouncing them back off of objects and they give you feedback. So it's almost like a TV screen underwater. And so now if you're smart, you just don't, uh, just don't su uh, uh, suppose that everything is clear sailing because it looks like clear water. You pay attention to the gauges and the electronics. You go, wow, this is not open water. The creek bed's over here. Let's stay in 20 foot of water. But over here is a landmine of trees. Let's stay out. of That kind of feedback becomes very important when you're going into areas you've not gone into before. And many times you don't know what you don't know. And you can't see what you can't see. That's why we as believers need to understand there's some things we don't know. There's some things that we haven't seen. But God in his mercy always will bring us someone whether it's himself through a, through a dream or a vision or a still small voice, or maybe he sends someone into our path that will give us the feedback that we need to keep us out of trouble. It's what we do with that feedback that's so important because most of us don't like feedback, especially if it's corrective feedback, right? I'm like, Who do you think you are? I'm the one preaching, not you. <laughs> You've not done this before. Well, put all that aside is, is, is what they're saying helpful, is it, is it trying to help me? I think about a story in 2 Samuel chapter 12 of King David. Most of you know who King David was, a very important uh, person in Scripture who was a worshiper as a child, uh, selected by the prophet to be the king of Israel. And so he's the one who killed the giant, Goliath. He's the one that worshiped in front of Saul and caused demons to tremble and flee and would become the king of Israel. But there was a season in David's life where he just got off course a little bit. If you remember the story, it was, it was a time of war. And so they sent all the warriors out to battle. And for whatever reason, he chose to stay home. Uh, not a good decision. He was one of the few men left around the city. Uh, he's in his, in his palace, which overlooking the city. It must have been a beautiful place and probably a very tall, uh, good view of the city. But he knew what he would be looking at if he went to the top of that t palace to look out over the city as the women would be bathing on the rooftops as was the custom. And so wisdom says, just stay off the rooftop, right? But he found himself curious and wanting to go hang out up there. And one thing leads to another and, and he's got himself in a lot of trouble. It, it's kind of a slow fade. When you start leaning that direction, you wake up in places you never dreamed you'd get. Uh, the sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you way more than you want to pay, right? And this was David's situation. But God in his mercy was wanting to give David some healthy feedback. I want you to see what you're not seeing. And so in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 1, it says, the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. And it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took from the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so David's listening to Nathan tell this story and David's getting upset. Because it's, it's, un, it's unjust what he's doing. This is not right. There's a man who has plenty that could have taken and, and prepared food from his own herd. But instead, he went and found someone who had very little and took what he had to make a meal for his friend. And David, so David's rising up with this righteous indignation and says, that's not right. That shouldn't be. 
And so David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So here David's upset and says, the man should die. And four times given back to the man who was taken from. And then Nathan says to David, you are the man. Now listen, our culture, you've heard that. You're the man. You're the man. We, God's fist bump, high five. You're the man. It wasn't that kind of, you're the man. <laughs> like, you're the man. In other words, David, you're the guy who's doing this very thing. Now listen, Nathan was sent by God to give David some important feedback. Because many times we can't see what we can't see. We get caught up in the moment. It seems like we have blinders on the truth. Isn't that what sin is and deception? Sin comes in and closes away truth. So you're not even seeing the things that you used to see. And I know great men and great women who get caught up in things. And, and all of us are susceptible. None of us are exempt from the possibilities. We have to be very careful and say, God, protect us from those things. But sin has a way of putting blinders on and you start losing the reality of the truth. And even great people strong leaders fall victim to things that you'd think they would never do that. They should never do that. Well, sin blinds you to all these things and only causes you to see the moment, not the, the, the future, not what the consequences are going to be. It's all about the moment. David's caught up in the moment. He's not seeing it, but God says, let me give you some feedback. This is what you're doing. And David's response is, I believe why God said, here's a man after my own heart. Because most of us, when we receive feedback like this of any kind, want to bow up and say, oh, no, that's not me. Not me. I didn't do it. I, I, I don't think that way. I would have never done that. You can't be talking about we, we are on, almost in denial or, or don't want to admit it. We live in a nation right now where no one wants to take responsibility for anything. No one wants just to own the fact that I made a mistake and I'm sorry and I should have done it. I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have been there. It's like, oh, no, he did it. She did it. They did it. It's not my fault. It, it makes my stomach sick when you, when you watch television and you see leaders, all kinds of leaders, that are saying one thing one day and another the next and they can't own up to the reality. And we live in a social media video capture world. People are saying, I never said that. And they've got all this video footage. You said that. <laughs> I mean, I know they could play with this stuff, but that was real. And there was 10,000 people that heard you said it. And it was only last week that you said it. You said it this morning. And then you said something else this afternoon. Listen, these things are wrong, but we're all guilty because we don't want to own our mistakes. We don't want to have to admit that we've had failure or we've done wrong, especially when it comes to the spiritual side of things, when we're really trying to please God, most of us in our hearts, but we all make mistakes. And David was upset at the man that did this until he realized he was the man. And then he says, oh my God, forgive me. I, 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 I see it. See, his his response was exactly what God needed. And this is my first point. When we receive feedback, we need to have gentleness and humility. He could have got fiery mad at Nathan for exposing him. He could have got mad at God for, for the whole situation. I mean, sometimes when people are confronted in their sin, it gets real ugly. All this denial and all this, and there's people that are even masters of shifting the blame so that when you confront them about something before the end of the conversation, you feel like you did wrong and they did nothing wrong because they can't just say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And yet David quickly, when he sees it, he doesn't try to deny it. He doesn't try to run from it. He doesn't try to change the storyline. He realizes I have done wrong. I have made a mistake. Nathan says, you're the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had not had been too little, I would also have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me, have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up an ad adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun, for you did it secretly. I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the sun. 
So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. David said at one point, I've sinned against Israel, I've sinned against my people, and I've sinned against God. The, the atmosphere has changed. The attitude has changed. He's not all mad anymore. He's not trying to defend himself. He's humble, and he's gentle, and he says, man, God have mercy. What have I done? I, I see the truth. And so he's the one that said, let the man die who did this, and let him repay four times. And yet when he finds out, I believe what he's doing here is he's demonstrating an act of repentance of owning his mistake and say, oh God, forgive me, I have sinned against you. There's no other, there's no other thing that can be said. I, I can't make an excuse for why it happened. Well, you, you see, it was because of this and it was because of that. Listen, he just flat out owns the reality that he has made a huge mistake and it should cost him his life. And he says, God, I'm sorry, I've sinned. And yet God in his mercy quickly says, and Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin, you shall not die. I don't know if we can catch that right there. This is the reality. This is not a small sin, guys. This is a big sin. He's, he's committed adultery, and then he's tried to cover it up through lying, and, and then he's they actually end up killing someone over it. And I mean, this thing has gotten from bad to really bad. And yet in a moment when God exposes it with, with feedback, he says, you're right. I have messed up, and I am sorry. I believe because his heart was broken and he was repentant, God spared his life and says, you're not going to die. I don't know about you, but I, I've made some mistakes in my life. And the best way to get God's mercy is just to say, God, I am sorry. Even with my own children, all I'm looking for is a heart change. I don't want to have to spank them. I don't want to have to discipline them. I don't want them to do without because they've made a mistake. So you're not getting dessert for the rest of the week. You're not, you're not going to your friend's house. You're never spending out with a person the rest of your life. You'll never get married. I don't know. When you're in that moment, there's a lot of nevers, you know, you'll never, never, never. Uh, but the reality is we don't want that, right? We want their heart to be broken and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And if that happens, the, everything changes. And when, when David says, I'm sorry, God says, all right, I'm going to let you live. Now, it still cost him. He still had to pay a price for his sin. Yet God had mercy on him and spared his life. So feedback needs to be quick, quickly responded to, I believe, with gentleness and humility, just to say, God, I'm sorry. Even with, with other people, when we've done them wrong, the best thing to do is just say, you know what? I made a mistake and I'm sorry and mean it. Don't be casual about it. Don't think this is my get out, get out of jail free card. No, no, I really need a heart change. I really need help. God, help me. We receive feedback with gentleness and humility. And I learned this growing up from my pastor, who happened to be my father-in-law for, uh, for 33 years. I married into the family. I married the pastor's daughter. And so I was in ministry at a very young age. Uh, chased her right into ministry, I guess you would say. Actually, I got saved prior to chasing her, but that was the greatest gift God gave me after salvation was her to be there to chase. Nonetheless, he, he would teach us this as we were growing up in leadership. He said, there's going to be feedback. There's going to be criticism. There's going to be people that come to say good things and bad things. But he gave us this rule of thumb. Anytime someone comes to you, and often it's right after a great victory, there's this I mean, you get off thinking you just preached a wonderful message and someone is in your face telling you why that is theologically wrong and you should have not said it and whatever. He says, listen, this is the three things he taught us. The first thing is don't respond. Anytime you're getting feedback, don't respond. Don't, don't get upset. Don't say something you shouldn't. Just, just sit there calmly, take it. Don't, don't have a response. It's kind of like I'm trying to keep a straight face here. I don't want you to see what I'm really thinking, but I'm not going to respond to this feedback. Then the second thing is, is there any truth in it? This is what I have to process. I, I've, just been, been, I've just been confronted about something. I'm not going to respond. And I'm going to ask the question, could there be any truth? In it? Our first, most of the time, firstly, we say, oh, there's no truth in that. That can't be any truth. But, but if someone's bringing us feedback, there's a reason generally why. Maybe it's misunderstood. Maybe it was uh, something that we didn't see or know about. But the reality is it was something they brought to us. So is there any truth in it? And the third is, God, what are you trying to teach me in this? And I, what I have found that when I get feedback, that if I won't respond in the moment, and then I'll just say, you know what, I'm going to meditate on this a little bit, 
I'm going to go away and I'm going to think about what was presented to me. Most of the time, there is some level of truth in it. Maybe it wasn't my heart, maybe my intention, but the way it was perceived, the way it was received, they have a valid point in that. And so my wife is my greatest fan and could be my greatest critic. And she does it because she loves me and she wants me to get better. But I have a hard time receiving criticism. I, I just like the praise. I mean, let's go back to how we started this service. You know, yay, yeah, that's wonderful. That's, you don't get a whole lot of those, honestly. And that had to be pumped up to get it, right? I mean, it's like, but you can do that again anytime you want. It's wonderful. But, but most of the time it's like, oh, I don't like anybody having to tell me something or give me that kind of feedback. But if they love us and we know they love us, then it's for our good. And so my wife will just say, hey, you, you kept going way over here to that side the whole time. You were just preaching to that one side or you had something right here on your mouth the whole time. You just look at me. I help you out. I mean, your hair was standing up, you know, or you, you need to smile a little bit. I'm like, there's so many things I'm trying to do while I'm preaching. I'm getting, but but she, she's learned when, when to release. There's a timing for feedback. We talk, I talked about that last week. She's learned how to, like, this is probably not a good time for me to tell him that. We'll wait till later to tell him that. But feedback's important. And so you have to say, I'm not going to respond. Is there any truth in it? God, what are you trying to teach me? Because this is, as we talk about a gentle and lowly heart this, and a humble heart, this is how God operated. This is how Jesus was. In Matthew 11:28. 28, it says, Come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, or I am gentle and humble. Jesus was one of the, the greatest, I'll say one of, he was the greatest leader the earth has ever seen. And yet he didn't come with this dominant personality. He didn't claim to be the latest greatest. He came with humility and he came with gentleness. And he got lots of feedback. There were a lot of people chasing him down, trying to kill him. A lot of false accusations against him. They were saying all kinds of things. And yet he was very gentle and humble and he would receive it with grace. Some things he would call out in the right time, but he would do it according to the word of God. He would do it with facts and truth and, and in an effort to see people's lives turned and change. And so feedback is healthy. And how we receive it is healthy. Proverbs 1, 5 says, A wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Wisdom says, get some feedback. I called a pastor this week. He's a pastor of a multi-campus church in Oklahoma that I have uh, some family that work for him. I know they're doing a great job. And so I called him and said, hey, I'm always trying to get better. We're, God's called us to take a region to, to reach 10,000 people or more, 20,000 people for the gospel. I mean, God has called us to, to really do big things in this region. In fact, I was in worship reminded of when we first came to Grand Bear, we were in a conference center and we were worshiping and God gave us a picture of this Lake Grand Bear, which is a, for the most part, a constant level lake. But I saw in the spirit that it was rising completely out of its banks. And it wasn't like some years ago where the water level was way low and boats were completely out of the water. What I saw was the opposite, the water level rising to the whole city was flooded by all of this water, which hopefully could never happen. But it wasn't a physical thing. I believe it was a spiritual thing that God says, I don't want the water level to be constant in Granbury, spiritually speaking. I want the water of my spirit to rise in this city. And I want to go to places that I've never gone before and touch people I've never touched before. This great revival that I believe is a part of the end time process of God. There's going to be this great revival that everybody's going to have an opportunity. Never, not to be able to stand before God and say, I didn't know. You had an opportunity to know. I made sure. And I believe he's going to accelerate that and increase that in this, in this time. But so there's this coming, this coming of God into the city, into this region. So I call this man and say, help me to do better at leading multiple pastors and multiple ministries. And so we talked for a while and I gained some things and he was so humble. He said, listen, I think you're farther out ahead than we are in some ways. So help me know how you're doing this, this, and this. And so we had a great conversation of you give me your best strengths and I'll try to give you my best strengths. We can become better together. And then before it was over with, I was telling him what God had put in our heart. And he says, let me, let me take it a step further. He said, my pastor is Craig Rochelle. Craig Rochelle is Pastor's Life Church, which is the largest church in America. He said, uh, so he said, I meet with him often because he's my pastor, and I've learned so much from him. He said, we're different in some ways, the way we do church and the way he does church, 
but he has a lot of wisdom. And then he said, how about I just connect the two of you and you guys sit at a round table together and discuss some of these things. And I'm thinking, wouldn't that be awesome, right? And so th- this feedback, if you value feedback and you welcome it and you're, you're humbled and say, God, speak into my life, God will have a way of connecting you with whoever he wants to connect you with to give you the feedback that he wants to give you, to teach you what you don't know. If you'll be faithful with little, God will make you ruler over much. And it comes from how do we respond? How do we value feedback? Romans 12 and verse 3 says, For I say, through the grace given to me, everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ, individual members of one another, having them gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. God says, listen, I, you're, just, you're just a part of the body of Christ. Even though I get to be on the platform this morning and get to share with you, I am just one part of the body. Christ is the head. Christ is the significant part of this whole body. He is the head. We all make up other parts of the body and all of us serving and feeding one another. He says, whatever gift or strength that you've been given, use it with humility and grace don't be like, oh, I'm the hand, <laughs> you're the man. <laughs> you might be the wrong man. You know what I'm saying? You might be the wrong hand. <laughs> like, I'm the hand. Well, the hand just got us in trouble. So I was, that's why I was asking, where's the hand? Because you're, you're at fault here. Listen, whatever we are, we realize that we're humble about it. And we're all part of a significant part of the body. My pastor used to tell me, and he was a very gentle, humble man. This did not sound like his nature. But at times I would kind of get in his office and what about this and what about that? And, and, you know, like I was somebody, you know, I was like, I'm, we're working hard at this. And he said, hey, calm down. He said, if you stick your finger in a bucket of water and you pull it out, the hole that is left is how significant you are. <laughs> I don't know if you ever told anybody else that, but I was told that more than once because I'm like... I, you know, this is pretty big stuff and I'm trying to get some stuff happening and it's all about me. And he's like, Hey, time out. Like God can replace you tomorrow with someone else. In fact, he replaces things real fast. <laughs> like, oh, I never thought about that before. There's no hole left. Why? Because it's God's house and God's church and we all make up. So don't think of yourself more than you are. Stay humble, stay teachable and realize that we all make up what's significance. My second point is this. We receive feedback by responding to it. So when feedback is given, it's important that there's be a response, right? I don't just say I'm ignoring that. I'm not paying attention to that. Wisdom says, is there any truth in that? God, what are you trying to teach me? And if there's some truth in it and I I need to learn something, then there has to be a change in my life. There has to be a response. Or maybe there needs to be a response given in that moment or to that feedback. How am I going to respond to that feedback? Now, I think there's two ways that we can respond to feedback. One is after the flesh, whatever I'm thinking, whatever comes to mind, that's what I'm going to say. Listen, that's a dangerous way to respond to feedback. And we joke about as we get older, our filter gets a little less and less. And we say things when we're older that we'd never say when we're younger. At least that's what I'm learning. Like, wow, they have lost their filter. And now I'm saying, wow, I think I lost my filter. (laughs) I just said that. (laughs) And there's nothing to stop that from coming out. That's dangerous. When we receive feedback, it it deserves a response, but not just a physical response. What about a response by the Holy Spirit? Pastor Daniel was talking about the Holy Spirit as a person. Welcome him at the table. Say, God, what would you say? You know, we really ought to ask when we're thinking about a response. You you have what comes to mind, and that's usually not the response we need to have, the response after the flesh. Holy Spirit, what is your response? You know, in Matthew 16, 13, Jesus came into the region of Caesarea uh, uh, Philippi, or Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, and, others, and one of the prophets. But he says to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood, blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, his response could have been, well, you're just another great leader or another uh, great prophet or, you know, all of these things. Yet Peter's response in this moment is not a natural response like some would give. 
Peter's response is the response of the Holy Spirit coming through Peter. You're the son of God. There was a revelation. He had an understanding that the others weren't maybe seeing in the moment that he saw in, in Jesus' that right there. That's the response I'm looking for. That's a response of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that in every situation with the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, we have an opportunity to give the right response. Uh, just this week, I was, uh, uh, we were at a staff meeting. We have fairly large staff meetings now with worship and ministry. And you missed it, Pastor Daniel. It was a really good staff meeting. <laughs> Um, and I, we usually record those. I don't think we got this and recorded, but it was, it was a good staff meeting, a lot of staff there, and had just a great time of worship. But I remember before the staff meeting, I went up to some young, some young boys in the lobby, and they were standing there with their father, and I said, guys, what are y'all doing? And they're like, oh, we're hanging out with our dad, you know, and they're just, they're young kids. And, and so I'm messing with them a little bit, and I said, you are? I was like, is this him right there? And they're like, yeah, that's my dad. And so I started, because I know their dad, he's one of our staff, I started to mess with them like, Oh, I don't know if I'd be hanging out with him or not. You know, that could be trouble. You just one of those kind of picking on each other. But I, I'm, I'm about to say something like, like I, I wouldn't hang out with that guy. This is their dad. <laughs> but my flesh is just going to say some, you know, crazy response to that, just picking on the kids. So I started to say, and it's like the Holy Spirit took over, and I said, "You're hanging out with him?" And they're like, "Yeah." And I'm like, "He's a superhero." And they're like, "Yeah." <laughs> and I'm like where did that come from? <laughs> I'm like, good call, Holy Spirit. I was, I was just going to mess with them and say something about their dad. No kid deserves anybody saying anything negative about their dad, right? And so in the moment, I'm like, thank you, God. There was a little bit of filter and you intervened for me. And now their dad's a superhero and nothing less. I'm like, Lord, help me have that kind of response all the time when it comes to giving and receiving a feedback that the response doesn't need to be after the flesh. It needs to be after the spirit. Yeah. And so I go back to don't react. Is there any truth in it? God, what are you wanting to teach me? Maybe those three things just give time for the Holy Spirit to take over. And, you know, I, I, I joke sometimes, they have it now, but I said some years ago, I said, I want to invent what's called the take back app. So when you text somebody something that you shouldn't text them, that it just sends it because you're going to, mm, there it went. And then you're going to be like, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that. And it has like this 30-second buffer that you can like click take back, and it comes back. And it was just like it was out there on its way, but it was like on pause mode. Are you sure you want to send that? They actually, I think they have that app now. If they don't, I still could be rich. It's a very wise invention because how many of you are like, I wish I could have taken back that? <laughs> Open mouth, insert foot. Like I was seconds away. I, that, those, that's... It's like maybe, maybe things like this, my, my tablet says, Siri not available. I'm not asking for your help. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe things like this would help us from getting in trouble and having a fleshly response when we just put these mechanisms in us that say when I'm confronted with feedback that I'm going to say, oh, no response. Is there any truth in it? God, what are you trying to say? Now I've given myself that 30 seconds of delay to not react, but to be uh, listening to God, how do you want me to handle this situation? Because I believe it's moments like that, how we respond in situations like that, that maybe many times would cause people to be receptive to the gospel because they know they just stabbed you with a sword and you did not respond in a wrong way. Jesus said, they slap you in the face, turn the other cheek, let them slap the other one also. In other words, don't have a reaction. Don't give them that opportunity. Don't give them what they're looking for. And I'm talking about sometimes negative responses because I think the devil comes really to try to get you off course, cause you to blow up in a moment you should have never blown up in and lose your reputation in a sense, your influence, all the things that you've worked on to build in, in a relationship in a moment can be lost by these wrong responses. And the third thing is this, sometimes feedback has to be rejected. Not all feedback is God sending you feedback. Sometimes the devil is just trying to mess with you. And he will send people to try to discourage you, get you off course, tell you things that are not true. Acts 16, it says, uh, in verse 16, now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. 
And this she did for many days. This little demon-possessed girl started hanging out around Paul and the disciples, and she was saying all the right things. Oh, these are men of God. They're awesome. You ought to follow them, yada, 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 yada. It's all great day one, right? But then day two, and then day three, and then like, this girl is wearing us out. Like, it was very kind of Pastor Daniel to say, hey, everybody give Pastor Cody a, a hand of appreciation. That's welcomed, and that's appreciated, and that's thankful. But if he does it every time I come around, I'll be like, all right, enough is enough. I mean, like, you're wearing me out. Get behind me, you know. I thought you were for me, but now I think you're against me, you know. You've taken it too far. This is what's happening. Some of this feedback was not healthy. Some of this was just a distraction. It was an interruption. And, and we as a church, we, we have to pray about those things and be conscious of those things. And we want great feedback and healthy feedback, but some feedback is just trying to derail you or get you off course. I remember going before my pastor because I was in his office many times. I was the guy that was kind of boots on the ground. And so I was trying to keep him informed of where we really were. And so I would, I would be out among some people and, and usually one person would say something a disgruntled person in the church, you know, and they don't want to want to go talk to the senior pastor. They just want to come talk to a high level leader. So, you know, he can get the message done for me. And so they would tell me something about, I don't like this, or this is done wrong, or we're frustrated, what, whatever. And so I would carry that weight and I, I've got to go tell pastor, he needs to know this. And so I'd go and I'd say, everybody's talking about this and everybody's saying, and, and all of this stuff. And he's like, really, everybody is I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, like, that's, that's, the, that's what's happening. That's what they're saying. Like, who's the everybody? I'm like, how, how many people? Like, can you just give me the names of every person that, that's having a problem right now? Well, generally, it wasn't even a handful of people. It was usually like one person. And so he's like, it's okay. You can tell me their name. If they told you to tell me, I need to know who they were. And I said, well, so-and-so said, and it's like, it, and I, who, who else? You said they, everybody. Where's, where's the everybody? I'm like, well, they said everybody. <laughs> well, he's like, listen, there's only one person, and there's a lot of us around here. So I wouldn't pay a whole lot of attention to what that one person, because that one person is always saying the wrong thing. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, so it's not everybody. No, it's not everybody. Don't worry. You're going to be okay. It's just, just one person. Now, let's pray for them. Let's love on them. Let's see if we can help them. But it's not like everybody's saying these things. But sometimes that's our perception with feedback is like, everybody. No, that's how gossip starts. It starts with one and then others pick up on it. And before long, there's this huge story. I remember it in Sunday school class, they'd say, whisper something in your neighbor's ear. And you go around the whole room. And then when it got back, you'd say, all right, the last person had to say what was said in their ear. It was nothing at all like the first person said it, right? It had gone through all these people and somehow it got changed till it got back to you. Like that wasn't said that way. So not all feedback is healthy feedback. And like these disciples, they had to reject it and say, look, get, get her out of here. She's, she's causing problems. Even though she's saying all the right things, she's saying it at all the wrong times. And so not all feedback has to be received. And, and I believe the Holy Spirit will give you discernment on the feedback that needs to be received and the feedback that needs to be rejected. Because there's feedback that leads to life and there's feedback that leads to death. And you should be able as a believer to know the difference. Is this helping me or is this hurting me? Is this pushing me towards my destiny and my future? Or is this causing me to slow down? And I've had people step out of ministry, step out of church because they heard something and they believed something that was not true. And years go by and then they reconnect and realize, why did I miss out on so much? Some never coming back because they misinterpreted something or they got some wrong feedback and because of it, who suffered loss? The enemy used that little phrase, that little saying. Maybe it's something that came from a leader. Maybe it's some, something that, someone in the church. Whether it was right or wrong, I don't know. But at the end of the day, is this leading me closer to God? Or is this disconnecting me from my destiny? I'm going to weigh this feedback. I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to submit it to God. And if there's no truth in it, I'm just going to reject it. I'm just going to say, I am not going to believe that lie. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to release him. And I'm going to go forward. And so I love this morning as Pastor Daniel was here with our uh, dream teams. We pray every Sunday morning before we get started in our services. And so all the dream teams together, Pastor Daniel was, was praying over us, speaking to us. But then he stepped into some great feedback. And the feedback he was, he was given 
was feedback from the Lord to him and through him. We would call that prophecy, being prophetic. But you don't have to put that label on everything. That's just the reality. Is God still speaks to his people. God still speaks through his people. And so he was given some amazing feedback to some people in the room. I, I want to give him some amazing feedback, and then I'm going to ask him for his help because he's really good at hearing God. You've got a, an amazing pastor and leader uh, who has been doing this for a long time. Amen? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the place you need to give praise. And I don't take lightly that a family is driving from Cleburne hungry for deeper worship, and God's just listening. And you know what that means? God's riding in the car with them, right? And so he's just listening that they just have a hunger for deeper worship so that when they get here, they say, hey, here's some CDs. Would you like some CDs to listen to? <laughs> really, God? You, you heard that? And you, that means your pastor is in a sweet spot with, with the Lord because God's wanting a blessing. Now, the next level, Pastor Daniel, that needs to happen is you need to get a brand new car with Bluetooth, and then whatever's on your phone could be in that car. Amen? <laughs> so that's what I'm believing for. Uh, cars don't even have what they call CDs anymore. <laughs> Whoever gave you those, like, I found these. I don't even know what they are, but you can use them. No, not really. Uh, but seriously, that's the kind of blessing God wants to put on this couple because they have given their life for ministry. They've been through a very difficult week last week, having a, had, a, had a vacation plan that got totally interrupted and did not get to happen. And, and they're, they're supposed to go to, to uh, Yellowstone, a place that I've always wanted to go. I had this big trip plan. That didn't work out. Going to another place, that didn't work out. Going somewhere else, that didn't work out. And so they finally just threw all their luggage in the back of their car and we're going somewhere. And so that's why I said, take a few extra days. You had a really rough start to your somewhere. But I'm grateful for you guys and very appreciative, and you're doing an amazing job, and, and, and you're, you're passing all the tests. And I'm finding out more about you, Pastor Daniel, than I've even known through the years, and I really feel like God has been keeping record of all those little things that you went through, and all the little things that, that were not good feedback and were not done correctly. And it's like God says, this is, you're coming into a season where it's almost like the reality of all them is coming to the table. A lot of things you had forgotten about. And it seems like you just keep stumbling ac across these like, oh yeah, I forgot I got stabbed there. And, oh yeah, I forgot what they had done there. It's like, man, my whole life there's like, and God said, you know what? I'm just kind of taking inventory because I am going to remove every single one of them from your life. And I am going to give you a double blessings for all the trouble that you endured and as a family and all these little things. It's like, God says, that's okay. I'm multiplying your blessing. Because when the enemy steals from you, it's not a terrible thing. God says, I'll make him pay back sevenfold, tenfold. I'll, I'll give you back what he's doing. And you've been stolen from a few times. So just let it be known that that day is going to be over and the return of what was taken is going to be greater than what was ever taken. That's the feedback I want to give to you because I believe that's what's going to happen. Amen? And, and I want to give some feedback to my brother-in-law. I call my in-laws brothers and sisters because we become family. He's like a brother to me, not a brother-in-law. I'm closer to him than I am my own brother. And we were, Pastor Daniel was giving feedback to him earlier and to us. And he's a very anointed worship leader. In fact, I'll agree with Pastor Daniel, the most anointed worship leader I know. And if you're around him very long, you'll, you'll discover that as well. That's not just hype. But he's in a transitional season. And I just want to declare over you that it's more than what you think. It's a complete shift into destiny. There's, he, he mentioned it earlier that you have a voice like, some of those that they're famous worship leaders, you're going to quickly turn the corner into the recording of songs that are going to go around the world. It could not be birthed any other time than right now. It had to be birthed out of this season. And so God's going to use that season that you've gone through. And it's, it's going to be that pure praise that sets people free. And you're going to see, it's almost a sound of deliverance. A, a coming out, a sound of deliverance that, that people gather from all over not just healing, but freedom from a mental lockdown that they've had that they couldn't get out of. And, and God's going to use your songs to, to bring those kind of freedoms. And, and there's many of you, Pastor, I want you to come. I want to take just a couple minutes. It's 12.08. If you give us like seven more minutes, we'll push to 12.15 here this morning. But, you know, it's, it's good to, so many times we get negative feedback 
We live in a world where, where, where the things that are being spoken to us and around us are mostly not healthy. There's not very many people telling you your spiritual destiny, your purpose. It's usually just a, a bunch of junk. And I think the church needs to rise up in this hour and let God's voice be more dominant than the voice of the world. Amen? You have anything else you want to share with anybody in the room as far as feedback this morning? Feedback. I, I want to say to this lady right here on the last row on the end, what's your name? Yes. Yeah. Debbie? Debbie, I saw you earlier as I was speaking, and I wanted to stop right then, but I felt like we could have gone all day. But I felt like the Lord was just saying, uh, I don't know, I just saw you almost like a calf at a new gate, if you've ever heard of that expression, like a calf at a new gate. But God says you're at His gate. And that's a special place to be. And when you come to His gate, it opens, and you walk through His gate. And there's blessing and there's provision. And God has so much for you. He wants to just bless you with. And so I just encourage you to just go in, enter his gates. As the Bible says, with thanksgiving. And into his courts with praise. Because he's got a new gate for you. And as you walk through it, I believe it's a place of provision. It's a blessing. And I just see you being taken care of and pampered like you've never been in your life. There's a time of pampering come to you. It's just a time of receiving from the Lord. And it's a special favor, the favor of God. And I wanted to say that earlier, but I'd, again, we could be here all day. I wanted Pastor Cody to be able to speak. But I encourage everyone to be able to speak. If the Lord speaks something to you, share that with other people. And uh, also this couple back here, the guy in the black shirt behind Chris, tall guy. Is that your <laughs> wife? Are your family? Are y'all related at all? You don't even know them. All right. Well, wonderful. What? Okay, girlfriend, you better speak up. <laughs> you accept him. Well, let me just tell you something. You are accepted. That's the word that the Lord has for you. You are accepted in the beloved. And I just want to encourage you, jump in with both feet. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't hinder. Uh, don't linger. But jump in with both feet. Because it's good. The water's nice. The water's fine. I just want to encourage you, jump in. The water's great. And so you, I would just see you've gone through a season of kind of like the summer, the hot summer. And the Lord's providing for you a cool place. And it's a place of refreshing. And I just want to encourage you to jump in because it's good. And the Lord has good things for you. He has a future and a hope, the Bible says. That's the word I have for you. A future and a hope. And, and the, the things you'll see around here, you'll see families and you think, man, they're so cool. I would love to have that someday. God says, I've got that for you. There's somebody driving a nice car. You say, man, I would love to have something like that. God says, I've got that for you. And so whatever you see, the Lord says, you're accepted. You know, it's like, it's like whenever you're, you got your credit card and it's denied or declined, <laughs> the Holy Ghost says, no, your card's not declined. It's accepted. And it's his card. That's the cool thing. It's God saying, here, here's my credit card. That's, again, it's like God's giving you his credit card. It's on him. Just jump in. Go ahead. Order it. He can afford it. Hallelujah. Praise Good. God. Good. Keep going. You okay. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Uh, the lady back here in the yellow shirt uh, next to Catherine. Are, are you all friends of Catherine's? Wonderful. You're in great company. You're in great company. I just believe the Lord's just has given you a sweetness. Uh, and like your yellow shirt, it's that, it's that, I don't know, I just see, sometimes I see pictures. I see like lemon. My wife, my wife always orders water with lemon. And uh, because the lemon gives the flavor, it makes something that normally is kind of bland sweeter and, and neater. And I just believe that you're like the sweetness that God is adding to situations and, and that you, whereas these people have received words of giving, I see you are a giver. And that you're, God's using you and pouring through you to bless others. And it's a time for you to show special favor. I just see you looking around and God saying, that's the one I want you to bless. That's the one I want you to go speak to. 
that's the one I want you to touch. And that you're his hands and you're his feet. As Pastor Cody, when he was holding up the hand, that was you. But it's, it's a good hand. It's This is the hand of blessing. And he wants to bless people through you. So listen to the Holy Spirit real closely. And just say, I don't know if God's called you here to stay. Or if God's called you through for a season. Or if he's called you here for a reason. <laughs> but I know God is going to use you to bless people. I hope it's us. I really do. I hope it's us as a church because you're a blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> well, again, we could go all day. Thank you, you Lord. Tisa, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and keep going until he tells me stop. <laughs> Tisa, I just believe you're coming into a season of, of the refreshing. I remember one day I was working in the summer. It was super hot. It was like this. It's over 110 degrees, and we were working outside. For a grass company and then one day all of a sudden we i was looking across the parking lot there was dirt all over the parking lot and this wind you could see this wall start to move and it was blowing the dirt toward us and i was standing there as one of those miserable after weeks of just standing there going oh nobody's moving all of a sudden that breeze hit us and it was a north wind that was cool like 20 degrees cooler and it felt like somebody turned on the air conditioning and that's what I feel is coming in your life. It's like a cool breeze. And you'll see it coming. And you'll say, oh, no. Is this it? Is this what Pastor Daniel was telling me about? You're going to be expecting it. Is this that cool breeze? And then and you, you'll see it and you'll feel it and say, oh, this is that cool breeze. Just say, Lord, thank you. And I would just encourage you, thank him in advance for it. And just say, Lord, thank you that you're bringing into my life refreshing. And that's what I hear, the times of refreshing. You've repented. There's things you've changed from. You know, the Bible says to repent so that you'll be ready for those times of refreshing that come from the presence of the Lord. You've already repented. You've already changed. And we've seen it in your life from where you were when you first came here. I wish I could, we had time to have you come up here and preach this. <laughs> It'll come. But from the time you first came to where you are now, you've already repented. But now I see times of refreshing are coming from the presence of the Lord. And it's just going to blow on you like a cool breeze. And you're just going to be able to relax and just say, oh, thank you, Lord. The effects of the heat are over. Amen. 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 This is the kind of feedback we need on a regular basis. This is nothing crazy. This is just God sharing his heart. And if you want the right kind of feedback, you just have to plant yourself in the right kind of atmosphere. And we can all be guilty of having talk radio or the news on. And, and the feedback coming from the world is not the kind of feedback we need to be feeding on. Interesting, the word feed is in feedback. What are you feeding on? Are we feeding on what God is saying about the nation? Or are we feeding on what the world is saying? Because the, the, what, what happens is in, in the natural has nothing to do with what God wants to do in the supernatural. Now, sometimes there's a parallel. Sometimes you'll see it in the natural first and then in the supernatural. I think we're seeing a drought in the natural because God's letting people get really thirsty for some fresh living water. So when, it, when he does come with a move of his spirit, they're going to be quick to say, I want that. I want that badly. I, I desperately crave that. But I'm telling you, we need to be a people that says, he mentioned worship in the car. That's so huge. Set the atmosphere to hear God's voice. Turn off the secular junk that's just feeding your soul. And it's not feeding it healthy stuff. And turn on worship that feeds your soul by the Spirit. Feeds your, feeds your spirit, man. And so set the atmosphere as a catalyst to be able to hear God's voice. Set the atmosphere in your home. Begin to hang out with the right kind of people that are saying the right kind of things. It's your choice. You, you make friends that are going in the direction you want to go. Call and talk to people that are going somewhere you want to go. When, when I was wanting to say, I need to be a better leader to lead this church to where we're going, I wasn't calling the little church down the road that had 20 people. And I'm not saying that disrespectfully, but I'm calling the person that's out there in front of me doing it at a higher level than me because I want to hang out with that kind of person because I need their feedback. If you want to grow spiritually, find someone that's, that's farther down the road than you are that can be a mentor. We talk about a mentorship program that can be a mentor to you and f be, become friends with them. Help me grow. And, and some of you, there's this church, I love this church because there's many of you that are older and you have, uh, it was interesting because we're trying to develop uh, 
what we would have called a senior adults program, but that didn't work because nobody's a senior adult. And, and they asked me if I want to be in it, and I'm not ready to be that either. I'm like, what are you talking about? But I heard something, I heard something a word that caught the other day was legacy. There's a, there's a lot of legacy builders in the room, and you've lived long enough to have a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge and a lot of understanding. Some of you have been Christians for a long time and have a well, uh, a depth of, of God's spirit on the inside of you. We need that released to those around you. You need to be just finding those that you know maybe aren't as far along as you are and say, with, with humility, say, hey, come here. I want to spend some time with you. I want to take you to, I would say coffee. It's too hot for coffee. I want to take you for ice cream and let's talk. I don't know why I have this. I have another one. <laughs> don't need that. Would you stand to your feet this morning? Uh, um, you'll have to forgive me. I got four more minutes out of you. You're at 1219. <laughs> you think we can make it at 1230? We got 11 more minutes. <laughs> I want our ministry team to come and be in the altar. Don't leave without getting anything uh, that you're going through. Someone to pray for you this morning. If you need healing, if you just need someone to stand with you in whatever situation, um, we'll have somebody here at the altar just to pray with you and minister to you. And if you're a part of the ministry team, I welcome you to come on up. Don't be bashful. Uh, we'll pray for as many of you as you like prayer. Let me speak a blessing over you today. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that every one of us as believers have the ability to hear clearly you speaking to us but i pray this word today there was something in it that stood out to every person in the room we have to ask ourselves holy spirit were you speaking to me what are you saying to me is there any truth in this that i can apply to my life and what will i do with it father let us not just take it and, and lay it aside but let it be planted deep within us that we learn how to give and receive healthy feedback to be even a messenger of you as pastor daniel was doing and others just letting you speak through us, Father. I pray let every person in this congregation have that ability by your spirit to hear your voice, to learn and grow from it, and even to distribute to others that need it so badly in this season. We pray for Granbury in this region, that the water of your spirit would begin to rise, that the temperature would change, that even as Pastor Daniel said, there would be a, a, a cool breeze begin to blow up on this region. By the Spirit, let that be the case, Lord. Let revival break out in this region, and we thank you for it. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys have a great week. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. We pray that you have been blessed by God's word. For more information, visit us online at heightslife.org.